So this first guy, we're going to write the roster method. Remember, what did the roster method mean? Yeah, you got it. Listed all out. So we're dealing with natural numbers. What is what are natural numbers? There you go. All non-decimals and negative numbers. No zero, too. No zero. So this information that's right here, oops, let's get the pen going. This information that's right there is giving us a restriction on the numbers that we want. So, so 11 to 21 is basically what we want. Absolutely. Because right here, this little part right there, because it is not equal to, we want to be, you got it, be greater than 10. So that means we're going to start at the next number after 10, because it's natural, which will be 11. So our roster method, you start with your squiggles, and you start at 11, and we're going to count all the way up to the 21. And we actually like the 21 because it's equal to in there. So 11, 12, 13, 14, no, no dots. I want you to actually write it all out. So we're not going to be lazy this time. So 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, end with squiggles. No cheating this time, no dot, dot, dot. I want them all there. So I know that you truly know natural numbers are no decimals, no negative numbers, things like that. So there it is. There's our answer. Any questions so far? Nope. Moving on. Number two. So number two is basically a true or false question. And if it's false, tell me why. Or you can actually provide a fix for it. So if we look up here, we want to know, oh, it's false. Is two an element of the question, but not bracket two or whatever you want to call it? Very good, very good. This little guy right there means is an element of. So what it's asking is, is the set to an element of that? And you're, you're correct in what you said. This is false. The set to is not an element of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven, eight, nine, oops, eight, nine, ten. Or another way what you said was very uh, right on the money. You could call this two is an element of one. I just said two. Two is an element of two. Yeah, absolutely. So just by saying false and two is not an or two is an element of it and not the set two, it's perfect. Yeah. So when you talk about this false idea here, let me grab something real quick. When you talk about this false idea here, give me the kind of a way to correct it. That would be a great explanation of why it's not true. So you can just put the line through the element of symbol or take off the set symbol. Both of these are good ways to correct it. Any questions? Uh, well, I guess you said this, so there is a leeway. So if you just said the match right here was like false two is an element not set two, that would just be fine, right? Yeah, absolutely. There are lots of ways to phrase this. Okay. So if, if you just said two is an element of the set, not the set to. Perfect. Lots of ways to phrase this. So question number three, determine whether the statement is true or false. So here, what does this little symbol mean right there? So we forgot that one. And that means subset. So subset means that all the pieces in front are in over here. Because remember, a subset, there we go. So it's false. Um, because remember, a subset, 
all these guys that are right over here have to be pieces of this guy that's over here. So if you look in there, Q is over here, R is over here, S is over here, but not the P. So this is a false statement. And just because P is not an element of the set Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. Another way that you could have fixed this, if you wrote out the set, you could easily just adjust the symbol subset right there with a line through it, saying it's not a subset of Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. Lots of different ways to answer this. There is some leeway for you, absolutely. So whether you like to write it out in a sentence or whether you just change the symbol, it's all good. It's all good. Any questions on this guy? Right on. Moving on. All right, so the next piece. So we got two questions here. One, what are all the subsets of one and two? So what do you think? Empty set. So we got the empty set. All right, hold on with the empty set. Let's talk about it. So the empty set can be written like that, the circle with the line through it, or you can write just the, just the an empty set. Two squiggles, nothing inside. Do not combine those two symbols. Do not combine those two symbols. What's another one? So just the set of the element one, just the set of the element two, and then the whole set. So there you go. There are only four subsets here. So perfect. Now, follow-up question says, which one of these is not the proper? The one and two. Remember, proper subsets means you cannot be equal. And the set one and two is equal to the original set. So that's why we do not call it a proper subset. Perfect. Any questions on that guy? All right. Time to start into those Venn diagrams. So the next couple of questions are going to be dealing with this Venn diagram out to the side, and we want you to tell me the set that is, represents this situation. So we want to list this all in roster form as well for the next couple of questions. So what does this little symbol right here mean? Uh, the, uh, <coughs> What's an M? What's an M? Not quite. It's all right. So that's why this is review. We call this the complement. What does the complement mean to us? Everybody that's not an M. Everybody that's not an M. So if you look at this circle over here, this is M. Everybody with inside my green little circle over there is an M. So what we want is everybody that is not an M. So that would be the 13 up here, the 6, the 4, the 11, the 21, the 16, the 23, the 12. We're going to take and we're going to list all those numbers out. Now, you can list them in any order you want, just as long as you give me all eight of those numbers. I always put them in order because that's just me. So you got 4, 6, then we've got 11, 12, 13, and then 16, and 21, and 23. So that right there represents the complement of M. Cool beans? Yeah. Moving on. So again, still the same picture, but now we've got a couple more symbols. How do we attack a problem where we have lots of symbols to deal with? What do we got to do first? Do them in order. Do them in order. Okay. So, M, U, V, and then M. So, 
So you want to start with this guy right here first. Absolutely. So let's figure out what M union N is. That's right. This little symbol right there, that means union, which means... Yeah, absolutely. It's as like a combination. It means give me everybody. So everybody in this circle and in this circle. Perfect. So, and again, I just list them in order. That's just me. So two, four, five, six and 9 and 10. Perfect. Now, what next? That's right. So, oops, let's change my little color there. Sorry. So this was first, and now we're going to go ahead and work on that intersection. So I'm going to write down what L is real quick because that's going to help us. So here is L. Who is everybody that's in L? Yeah. So there's everybody that was in that circle. And now when you look at the intersection of this, Intersection is all about, and that's what this little symbol is right there, intersection. What's in common? So what's in common between those two sets? There you go. There you go. And you can see that in our picture right here. Woo! Underneath my little school goes right there were two, four, and five. Cool beans? Yeah. All right. Next guy. So now, again, a little bit longer. So how do we approach this? What do we got to do first? M intersection N. There we go. Which is 92. All right. So we get, we're going to do this guy first because when we talked about this, there's kind of like an order of operations to this. First, you work in your parentheses. Second, you do any complements. Third, you take care of your unions and intersections. So we're going to work in our parentheses. There's no complements in there. So we're going to go ahead and do the intersection. What is the intersection of M and N? Two and nine, because that's this guy right here. Little football shape right there. So that's two and nine. Oops, no parentheses, silly me. And if I could grab the eraser, that would be great. Two and nine, and then squiggles. Okay, so that was first. Who do we hit next? Uh, M, and L for M intersection L, perfect. Perfect because that's this little guy that's right in there. So that's five and two. And yeah, I know I didn't put them in order, but it's okay. So that was our second guy. And then finally, what do we do? You got it. So now we're going to do the whole thing. We're going to put these sets together because that's what union was. Put these sets together. Yeah, if it was the intersection, it would have just been the number two. But union means give me everybody. So two, five, nine. And that's what we want. Good so far? Okay, moving on. All right, so... This guy right here, the next ones, we want to be able to, I mean, you could do this with the sets, but it's a little bit easier if you make your own Venn diagram for this. 
So let's make a Venn diagram for this and then answer our questions because that's going to make things a whole heck of a lot easier. Me too. And we don't judge on your circles. So we've got three circles in here. Let's call this guy A, B, C, and our giant box represents the union. When we make Venn diagrams, where do we start? We s not with the universe. We start everything in the middle, right in here. So when you look at A, B, and C all together, when you look at these guys, who is in common in all of them? Who is in all? All right, so there's no one in common. So there will be nothing in this middle circle. So now we're going to start working between our two circles. So now we want to talk about just between A and B. So you come over here and look at your sets between A and B, or A and B, not B. And who do we got in common? There we go. So we'll put C and D in there. Who's in common between B, C? Okay. So we'll put E between the B, C. Who's in common between A, C? A. Okay, good. And we should have been marking stuff off as we go along. So we've already taken care of A. We've taken care of B, C, and D. Oh, no, we haven't taken care of B. Just kidding. And we've taken care of C, D, E, and we've taken care of A and E. So now when we look in circle A, who do we have left for them? B. And I should mark these up above. Yeah, we've taken care of D, E. All right, who do we have left in B? F. F. So we'll cross those off. We'll put F and B. And then who do we have left in C? G. So we'll cross it off. We'll put G down here. And then there's no one in the universe because we've used all of our letters. So now that we have this guy right here, our Venn diagram, I want to copy paste this guy real quick. because I want to use it later on. Ah, uh, that's all right. We'll do it here in a couple minutes. Let's go ahead and just finish this problem out. So now we want to do A union B. A union B. So basically, we want this circle and this circle. So what did you get again? There you go. A, B, C, D, E, F. And there you go. All right. So let us grab some things real quick. Well, that was no bueno. Put my little circles back on because I wanted to use this chart again for our next couple of questions. So let me lasso this guy. Well, that's no good. Let's lasso it again. And we will take and uh oh, it didn't grab everybody. Let's go back and undo that. Looking for the copy paste real quick. There we go. So that way, hopefully, when we go to this guy, we can paste that back in because we want it. Go back over here to paste. 
And of course, it didn't give me everything I wanted in my picture. Fantabulous. So let's just throw that information back in real quick. Hi, man. Just kidding. I need my draw tools. That's what I need. So this was A, this was B, this was C, and we had the universe, and then again, throwing everybody in, this was C, D, there was E, there was A, there was B, there was F, there was G. Okay. Let me try and lasso and copy and paste this again real quick. Uh, silly technology in me. Go back to draw. All right. So I got it copied and all that stuff now. All right. So this time, what are we going to do first? Uh, the stuff in the parentheses. So in the section C, which is E. You're right, Brandon. So definitely do the B intersects C. So when we look at that, we come into here. What is in common between B and C? The letter E. There we go. And now what are we going to do? The complement. So what did complement mean again? Everything not that. Yeah. Give me everybody else but E. A, B, C, D, F, G. There you go. So now we just do the complement of this, which is A, B, C, D, F, G. That's a G. And there you go. All right, jump into the next guy. Let's see if my copy and paste worked on this one. Uh, wrong one. Home. Paste. Yes! Triumphant. All right, so back to draw. What do we do now, Brandon? You need the complement first. So here is C. I need everybody that's not in that. There we go. B, C, D, F. <clears throat> then we need the intersection between that and A. So I'm going to go ahead and write out what A is. So that's my circle right up here. So A is A, B, C, D, so what is in common between these two? A intersect C. There you go. B, C, D. Perfect. <clears throat> so much easier when you have that Venn diagram to follow you along. All right. So let's... Drop in our Venn diagram again. Move it up right over here. Okay. <clears throat> so what are we going to do now? Didn't mean to do that. A union B. So A union B. So we're looking at these two circles right here, and we're going to put them together. So that gives us what? A, B, C, D, E, F. There you go. A, B, C, D, E, F. Done. Put a squiggle on the end. And then we use the intersection between that and C. There we go. We're going to do the intersection between that and C. A, union, B, intersect, C. And I'm going to go ahead and write up C up here. That's a horrible C. C is our circle that's right down here, which is A, E, G. 
So what's in common between my two sets? A and E. A and, e. and you can kind of see that right up here. There's my A, there's my E. And there we go, squiggles and all. Feeling good? Yep. All right. Number 12. Yes, you got it. This little N means cardinal number, which means the total number of elements in that set that we're going to look at. So if I want to find the total number of elements in the set, what do I need first? The complement of B. So again, I almost forgot. Let's put up our little picture. We'll just slide it right over here this time. Which is what again? What's the complement of B? Bag. Because there's B. We want everybody that's not in it. So you can call it bag or A, B, G because I like to put stuff in order, but that's just me. <coughs> that's true. And then now we want A... Union, B, complement. So again, A is right over here. I'm going to go ahead and write it out. A, B, C, D. So what are we going to do between these two sets? And we will. Not four. Remember, union says, give me everybody. So we take these two sets here, A and B, and we combine them together. Yeah, don't forget the G. So the cardinal number is five, because there were five elements. And I'd rather have you write it out like that if you choose to. Yeah, get into the habit of that. Okay. So, there we are on that one. Any questions? So far, so good, he says. All right, now, now we got the same kind of idea, but just now we're going to put it in the context. <laughs> so you guys have seen one like this when you did jazz, classical, and rock. Just this time we, where it's mathematics, physics, and chemistry. So the first thing we ask you to do is make a Venn diagram. So let's make our Venn diagram. And it will be three circles because we have math. We have physics. And we have chemistry. So again, where do we start with this? <clears throat> the center. So how many people took math, physics, and chemistry? 14. 14. So this number 14 goes right there. Now we start working our way out. So let's talk about the math and the physics part. How many people took math and physics? 28, so math and physics, there were 28. However, you have already accounted for how many? There we go. So we got to take that 14 out because you've already accounted for 14 of those 28. So how many really just took math and physics? 14. Okay. Well, let's talk about physics and chemistry. How many took physics and chemistry? Oh, there we go. Now you're working ahead of me. So physics and chemistry, you said there were 22, but we already had 14. So what was 22 minus 14 again? Eight. Okay. And then how many took math and chemistry? So you said 12, which is great because there were a total of 26, and you subtract 14, that gives you the 12. Okay. So now, 
we want to just talk about those that took math. Okay? So how many just took, or well, how many people took math? Let's answer that question. All together, there were 64. Ah, yes. Okay, so you're absolutely correct with that. We already have some of these guys taken care of. We already have 14 students taken care of, and another 14, and another 12. So we need to subtract all that off. And how much did you get? 24. Okay, so we got 24, so that goes right up here into my math, all right? What about physics? How many took physics? You got it, so there were 58. And then he's taken off everybody else. So that's take out the 14, take out the 14, take out the 8. 22 is perfect. I don't know why those look like that. That's horrible. 22. Okay. And then now we're just down to chemistry. Which is a whopping 60 is absolutely correct because you have 94 and you're going to take out the 12, you're going to take out the 14, you're going to take out the 8. Are you to ask, were this calculator allowed on test? Yes, you can absolutely use the graphing calculator on your test. Yeah, the T inspires fine too. Yep. And then you have one more piece of information we have to take care of. which is the universe. How many people did we talk to total? 200. 200. And then now we got to take out everybody else that we took care of. So we're going to do a lot of subtraction. Minus 24, minus 14, minus 14, minus 22, minus 12, minus 8, minus 60. Forty-six. Just in the universe. And that's what they wanted on part A. Now that we have this information, we can go and start answering all of our questions. For B through F. We're going to copy it. And we're going to go get all of our information now. So here we got lots of information, and all we're using is, oh, look, they already provided that picture for me. Fantastic. So all we got to do is just answer some numbers. <laughs> so exactly one of these courses, which numbers are we looking at for that? You got it. These numbers right there. Add them all up, and you get 106. Love it. Okay. So it says none of these courses. So who was that again? Yeah, that's the guy in your universe. Because none of these guys in the 46 took math, physics, or calculus. All right, so it says at least two courses. Where are the at least two courses? Yeah. There you go. It's all for those numbers because, yeah, exactly. These guys right here that are underlined in red, those are the ones that took two courses. The one right here that's underlined in blue, they took three courses. And remember, at least means that you can be two or more. You got it. So you add all those up, and what do we get? 48. Perfect. All right. So here's kind of the idea in this one. So you got to remember what does and mean. But you also know that... 
we do not want any physics. So you can kind of think about it like this. This entire circle right here that is physics doesn't exist for us anymore. So what does the and mean for us? Yeah, this is the intersection. So what is the intersection between? There you go. So it is 12. The one below it is the union. The one below it is the union. Absolutely. So again, this guy right here, that's the union. So that's a total. But remember, we are throwing out physics. So none of this exists for us, even the guy on the outside. So all we want to do for the union is add those numbers. What did you say again, Brandon? Uh, 96. 96. Perfect. And there we go. Cool beans? Big thing on this one is you had to make sure that you get this uh, Venn diagram table correct because everything else is dependent upon that Venn diagram table being correct. Yep. All right. Ah, truth table, my favorite. <laughs> so let's start jumping in the truth tables. Okay. So how many statements do we have? Just P and Q, right? No, there's more. Well, there are more, but as far as statements goes, there's only two. Oh, okay. P and the Q. Oh, yeah. So we do the setup. What does it look like? True, true, false, false, P. And then we check lines on this paper. <laughs> and then true, false, true, false. I know you wish they had lines on it, but your test will look just like that. There will be no lines. All right. So now, when we do truth tables, how do we attack this? So first, we do the as usual. Well, we'll do the negation of Q first. That's right, because you'll work inside the parentheses, and your first thing is take care of negations. All right. So negation of Q. You said false. True, false, true. Okay, then what do we take care of after negations? So what does the B mean? Uh, that is the or. Yeah, that is your or. So we're going to take care of the or statement, which is our parentheses. That's correct. It is only false when everything's false. So you're going to look between this column right here and that column right there. So, true, false is true, true, true is true, false, false is false, that's your false case, and false, true is true. And there we go. And then your fourth one, which we don't have in this case, you would take care of conditionals and biconditionals. But we don't have to worry about that. We just now work on the outside, which we take care of the and. So now we're going to do, I'm going to move my truth table down some, P and P or, come here you, eraser, there we go, now my eraser is working. Negate Q. So we're doing the whole thing. So we look between this column right here and P. Uh huh. True, true, which is true because ands are only true when both are true. Yep. And the other two are both falses. And that's what we're looking for on this. Okay, so let's hit up some more truth tables. Let's move on to the next guy. Okay, we're definitely over halfway through now, so. How many statements do we have? Uh, 
You're thinking too hard. How many statements do we have? P and Q, so it's only two. There's only two statements, so it's P, Q. So you got to get that set up first. So it goes what again? True, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So what are we going to do first? Negation Q. Negation Q. All right, so let's do that. Which gives us what? False, true, false, true. And then what do we do? We don't have the P and Q column up here, so we can't do the next negation yet. You still got to work within your parentheses. Complete your parentheses first. P and Q. Okay, so we're going to hop over to the other parentheses, and you can, and that's fine. We can do that. Yeah. So we're going to do the P and Q, which means I got to look at those two columns right there. Okay, we can do that too. So we're going to go back. We're going to work and finish up the parentheses that we were already in. So let's go back and let's do that, which that's what I would have done. All right, so now we're working between these two columns. So what does or mean? Uh, anything. It's only false when everything's false. Only false when both are false. So true, true, or true, false gives us? True. True. True, 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 false, false, and false, true, it is true. So there we go. There's our first parenthesis. Now we can jump over to the other parenthesis. So both have to be true here in order to be true. So we're looking at this guy. So you said again, what again? True, true is what? True? True, false? Ah, everything else is false because we have a false statement with each one of those. All right, so now we've done our parentheses, so we work on the outside. So, Brandon, you're absolutely correct. We're going to take the negation of P and Q. So, you said false. True, true, true. And then now we'll do everybody, the whole thing. So I haven't used green yet. Let's grab green. So now we want to do P or negation Q. This Whatever this double arrow is. And negate P. And Q. I don't know why I put an and sign there. It doesn't need to be there. Let's just fix that real quick. So what does this double arrow mean? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's basically if then. Not an if then. Basically the requirement like if. So the requirement that this. It's not an if then. This little double arrow means biconditional. You're, it is if and only if. No, you can't start with if with a biconditional. It'd be I go to the movies if and only if it's raining. I was thinking like I can read if and only if like I do my work. There you go. There's another biconditional. So this this arrow double arrow means biconditional. That's a conditional. Oh, you can't say then and only then. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. All right. So what what do we know about the biconditional? Ooh, throwing stuff around. They have, they have to have matching truth values. They have to have matching truth values. So here we're looking at these two columns right here. No, excuse me. Bad, Mr. Armstrong. Not those two columns. These two columns. So as long as they have matching truth values, they're going to be true. So false, true, false, true. 
False, true, false, true, I agree. Because true, false gives me a false answer. True, true is true. False, true is false. And true, true is true. And that's what we were looking for. Okay. Well, let's move on. So again, we're going to do a truth table, but the cool part about this truth table is we don't have to work half as hard because they're already just going to, they want us to look at one case only. What happens when the P is false and the Q is true? Well, normally, it would be that it's a conditional to the... Uh, well, let's start talking about the conditional. So that's what we got to do first, right? Consequent. All right, hold on. Let me get to write some of that stuff up because you're giving me some great information, Brandon. So we know that in here, the guy before your arrow is what we call the antecedent. And the guy after your arrow is what we call the consequent. And the conditional statement is the one that you have to be careful on because the order of your symbols matter. And the, in order for a conditional to be false, the antecedent must be true and the consequent is false. So if we look at this, the antecedent is true, the consequent is false. So this is a false statement. Beware the conditionals because you've got to know who the antecedent is. You've got to know who the consequent is. And <laughs> you can also think about it like that. Yeah, like the arrow with the car and get hit. There you go. So now we can look at the full negation, which gives us what? True. true. And that's what we want. In the end, we just want to know that, hey, this is true. Just an answer. Is this, this is college mathematics. You are correct. Why would you be here no, I just can't push out of two. So, all right, moving on to the next piece. <clears throat> all right, so it says write the following statement in symbolic form and construct the truth table for it, and then we got a follow-up question. So remember that I kind of do some annotation with this. So I underline, oh, I see that word if. That means later on I've got that word then. That's important to us. But I underline my first sentence. I see an and. I put a box around it. I underline the next sentence. And then I underline my last guy. Anything that's underlined, those are your statements, right? So it says you are happy. So what do you want to call that statement? P. I see the word and. So that has to be one of our symbols. Say it again. The N? What does it look like? Yeah, it looks like an upside down V. A rooftop. Living, <laughs> you can call it N2. The next guy is your Q, because it's all about living contently. The then is an arrow. And then last but not least, you have a Q. And I don't know where my other symbols went, so let's put them right back up here. Weird board. And, oh, actually, my last guy should have been R. Because, again, my other symbol disappeared. So that was Q, and that's R. Now, yes, you got to remember dominance of connectedness. This was our strongest symbol right here, because there are no commas. So that means we are going to put parentheses before because that's where we have more than one statement. We never put parentheses around one statement. That's just weird. So now what they want us to do is run a truth table for this. All right. So how many statements did we have up here? Three statements. So this one's going to be a little bit bigger of of a truth table. So I'm going to put it down here below because if not, we would be running into everything. All 
All right, so the setup goes true, 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 false, 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 false. And then it goes true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And then we alternate true, false, true, false, true. I don't know what that symbol is, but let's fix it. True, false, true, false. So now we start working on our symbols. So what do we do first? All right, so we want to do P and Q, the parenthesis part. And then you're pretty much almost done. So we're looking at these two columns right here. Slide it up so I don't get rid of them. So true, true gives us? Uh, true. true, true gives us? True. And everybody else down below that will end up being false because they have a false statement in each one of those. So false, 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 and false. And now we do the conditional. So P and Q in parentheses, arrow R. Who is the antecedent since this is conditional? And then R is the conditional? The consequent. No worries. So again, conditionals are only false when? All right, so what is? True, true, get me. Yes, because that's our true false situation where it is false. What's the well basically what do the rest of them give me now? All trues. True, 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 true. So this is what they want in part A. That's what they want in part A. Part B, if we read it, it says indicate the set of conditions that make the compound statement false. So where was my compound statement false in the end? Right there. And what did we need in order for that to happen? Yep, P and Q to be true, and the R had to be false. So that's the answer to part B. P, Q had to be true, and the R had to be false. Okay, drain your soul. Interesting thought to this. All right, any questions on that guy? Got a quick one? Oh, no. Oh. All right, 18. So this time, it wants to know which statement is equivalent. Which statements are equivalent? Okay. So, let's talk about this guy. The thing that you need to do first is convert these into symbols. And then from there, you can look at a truth table for it. Or if you remember all those equivalents I gave you in class, they might be able to help you out as well. <laughs> no worries. So, let's first get our equivalent statement looks. So up here it says, saw original King Kong. What are we going to call that? P. P. I see an or. So that is the V. The 2005 version. That is, yeah, the original King Kong back in black and white. And then the 2005 version, that's the one that had Jack Black and I want to say it was Loki that was in it. That was super tiny back then. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he was a, a a film, yeah, film artist and all that stuff too. So yeah. And then they have the new one that had Samuel L. Jackson and some other people. Actually, I think that was the one that had uh, Loki in it. Can't remember who the 2005 version had. That was the male lead. But no worries. Neither here nor there. 
So this is our original statement. This is what we're going to compare everybody to. So now we've got to get these other guys. So I see the word if. That means right here at that comma, there should be the word then. Because remember, this is just another way to write an if then. We don't always have to put the word then. But it says, I did not see calm. Because I see that word not in there. What does this first statement look like? That's negation P, because P was all about seeing the original. Then we got the then, and what is that statement? Uh, arrow. That's your arrow. And then I saw the 2005 version, which is Q. So that's what the second statement looks like. Okay? Now, down here it says, I saw both the original Kong. I see an and and then the 2005 version. So what does statement B look like as symbols? There you go. Second statement looks like P rooftop Q. Because the first sentence right here is all about P. Then you got the and, which looks like a rooftop. And then the 2005 version, that was all about Q. Okay, the next guy says, I saw the original Kong, then I did not see the 2005 version. So, there you go. Third sentence looks like P, arrow, negate, Q. And then, last but not least, I see the word if. That means there's a then, which represents by that comma. It says, I saw the 2005 version then I did not see the original. So what does that look like? There you go. Now, all we got to do is look at truth tables for these and see what happened. See which one is equivalent. Because I don't think in our list of stuff that I said that is equivalent, I gave you anything that looks, that will match this. So, how many statements do we have? Uh, two. Just two. So, this isn't a very big truth table. We got P. We got Q. Long line to this one, because we got to look at all those guys. So, we got true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So, let's get our original statement first. So, it says P or Q. Because that's what, this is what we're going to compare everybody to. So, or means what? False. Only false when both are false. So what do we get for the first? True, true, false. True, 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 yeah, sorry, I false. Say, I said no worries. Mistake. Yeah, because true, true is true. True, false is true. False, true is true. False, false is false. Okay. Like true, All right. False. So now we're going to go statement by statement, and we're going to find which one matches true, 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 false. That's what we want. All right, so we got a negate P. There's no negation Q in this guy right up here, just a negate P. Yeah. We will. We'll get to all of them. So what is the negation of P? Yeah, you got it. F, F, true, true. All right, so now we'll do the conditional. So negate P, arrow, Q. So who is the, con or excuse me, the antecedent? The one before the arrow, which is? Negate P. Who is a the consequent then? All right. So remember, this is only false when the antecedent is true, the consequent is false. So it's true, 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 false. So this guy is true because it's false, true. This guy is true because it's false, false. The next guy is true because it's true, true. And the last guy is false. So, this was A. What do you notice? 
It matches. This is the equivalent. The star right here to my A value right here. Notice they're the same. True to true, true to true, true to true, false to false. So now you actually know the answer. You don't really have to continue, but I do want to show you the other ones so that way you, you know that it really is just these two. So the answer to this guy is really A. But the other guys real quick. Well, kind of. So let's take a look at the next guy. Ands. Ands are only true when both are true. So my first statement, true, true, is true. My second statement and third statement and fourth statement will all be false. So you can see how B does not match my star. Okay? If we look at C, so the P conditional negate Q, well, we'll need to know what the negation of Q is. So, come on, give me a different color. There we go. So let's negate Q first, and then we'll do P arrow negation of Q, and then we can do the last guy. So negation of Q would be false, true, false, true. Okay. And then the conditional, well, the P this time would be the constant or excuse me, the antecedent and the negation Q would be the consequent. So if we look at this, again, remember, it's only false when the antecedent is true, the consequent is false. So your first guy is actually false because it's the false statement because it goes true to false. The next guy is true. Come on. The next guy after that is true. And the last one is also true. So is it both false? Yep. For the, for the conditional, if they're both false, it's true. Again, the only way a conditional is false is if the antecedent is true, the consequent is false. And then last but not least, if we do the Q negate or conditional negate P. So in this one, the Q goes back to being the antecedent and negate P becomes the consequent. So if we look between those two, your first guy is false. Your second guy is true. Your third guy is true and your fourth guy is true. And that was the D answer. I didn't put up which one was the C one, so let me put that up real quick. That was the C answer. And you can look at B, C, and D do not match the star. B, C, and D do not match my star. Exactly. We cannot remember that. Are you going to put something on the board for us to remember? We'll talk about that in class. Okay. All right. So there it is. That's number 18. All right. Number 19. Okay. So for number 19, there is a picture that should have been displayed up here, and I don't see it. So that's okay. We'll work through this piece by piece. The first thing you need to do on number 19 is turn this giant sentence right here into symbols. So we need to turn this giant statement right here into symbols. So we're going to go through. It says there was an increase in the percentage of the budget spent on food. Then I see an or. And more specifically, what do you see right in front of that or? A comma. So that makes this guy the strongest one there when we talk about our last symbols. So what do you want to call this first sentence? P. Yeah. What is the symbol for or? The V. Perfect. Okay. Now it says, my next sentence, it says there is not 
an increase in health spending. Ah, negate Q. Good, I like it. And I like that you said negate because there is a not in there. So this guy right there looks like negate Q. I see the word and. What is that? The rooftop. The rooftop. And then we got this last statement. By 2010, the percentage of the percentage spent on health care was not more than triple the percentage spent on food. Negate R because there is also that not there. So our sentence, what we're looking at is this. Uh, was negate Q, negate R. But remember, this guy was my strongest symbol, so where are my parentheses? Brown, e, and Q. No. E and no. You, your, your parentheses are either before the symbol oh. or after. Your parentheses go there. So this is the statement we're working with. Now, this, up here it says determine the truth value for this. Well, in order to do that, we needed that little picture. Let me give you a brief idea of what this picture looks like. This right here was food over the years. This right here represents health care over the years. This guy right over here is 2010. And the percentage for that what was the percentage in 2010 for food? 7%? And then for healthcare, it was 16%, right? So that's both things? All right, so hold on. So let's start talking about some things now. Because what you have to do now is you have to figure out the truth values for these guys. So our statement P, okay? Our statement P. It says that there is an increase in the percentage of the budget on food. So as you look over the years, was there an increase? Opposite. Yeah, that's false. P is false. P is false. Well, let's talk about Q real quick. Now, remember that this is the negation of Q. So that means the original Q says there is an increase over the year. So is that true or false? True. That is true. Because you're looking at the negation up here. So the negation of that statement up there says that there is an increase. Excuse me. The original statement says that there is an increase. And you can see that. Real quick, right over here. See, food is decreasing. So that's what made the P false. Over here, the original statement for healthcare is that it is increasing, and that's true. My arrow is going up. Now the last guy. This is the one that you got to be careful on. So the original statement to this guy says that the percentage spent on healthcare was more than triple, okay? So the question is, is this number right there nope. triple of that guy? Nope. No, because 7 times 3 is 21. That's so, yeah, this guy right here is not triple that guy. So... The original R is false because the original R says 2010's percentage spent on health care was more than triple. And we just showed you that it was not. So here are the truth values that we're working with, and this is what we want to run the truth table on. So we have three statements, P, Q, R, we already know the truth value, so this is not a long one. We know that P was false. 
Q was true, R was false. So now all we got to do is run our statement that I kind of hid right up above. All right, well, let's find out. What do we do first up here? Negate Q. So let's work in our parentheses. Negation of Q. What is the negation of Q? False. Then what do we do? Negate R. What does that give us? True. True. And then, uh, okay. Yep, that's right. Because the only way for an and to be true is that they're both true. So this is a false statement. There we go. P or blah blah blah. So we're looking between these two columns right there. And that gives us a false statement in the end. Any questions on that one? There's a lot there. The first thing you had to do was in symbolize the sentences. The second thing you had to do was figure out their truth value based off of the table. And then the third thing you do is you actually run the table for it. Run the table for it. Okay? All right. Jumping on to the next guy. So, hey, there was my table. There it is. Weird. They just put it on uh, a separate one. That's okay. So, there was the table that I was talking about a moment ago. But no worries. No worries. We got it. So let's jump on down to number 20. So now we're just rewriting sentences. What does the contrapositive look like in symbols? Uh, well, if it's uh, P and Q, then the contrapositive will be negate P, then negate Q. No. So does that get P and Q, or P then Q? So the original statement would be P, Q. That's what you got there. What is the contrapositive then? There you go. There we go. Yeah. All right. So all we got to do is take the sentence and apply the negation to Q, put the if thens in there, and then apply negation to P, which would be what? What would this be? So if. There you go. So there's the negation of Q. There's our if then completed. And then what was the negate P part? I will not or I can't, I won't play video games. Perfect. There it is. That's all we're looking for. Take that sentence up there and give me the contrapositive to it. Oh, now I give the thingy. Number 21. So again, this is PQ, but what's the converse? Uh, well, converse would be Q would negate Q and negate P. No. Converse is negate P negate No. What is the symbols? Q then P. There we go. No negations. No negations. So, if what? No. Give me Q first. So, if I am not... Because it's originally that. You're just switching them. That's all Converse means. If I'm not going to the mall, then what? 
then it is cloudy outside. Yeah, all Converse means is switch the two. Don't change anything, just switch them. Okay, all right, number 22. 22, so original statement is P arrow Q. What does the inverse look like? Nope. There you go. The gate P, then the gate Q. So if what? There you go. If you, there you go. If I don't, or if you don't go to the movies, I should put two in there, not go the movies, not cavemen talk. to the movies, then I am joining the circuits. There you go. All right, any questions over changing sentences around? Okay, 23, so up here it says, which of the statements are equivalent, if any? So again, this is just like what we did before. We need to change these into symbols, and then let's just run a true table on it, see what happens, okay? Again, you could look at the equivalent statements that I gave you and see if any one of them are on there, but I don't think you'll see any one of them on there. So we have to definitely run the truth table on this. So let's take our first sentence. I see an if, that means there's a then. So it says, he is guilty. So who's that going to be? P. There's a then, so that gives me an arrow. And then it says, he does not take a lie detector test. Negate Q. Good. So we're going to look at that guy. So the next one says, he is not guilty. Negate P. Negate P. Hold on, weird symbol again, popping up. I see an or. So that's our V. And then it says, he takes the lie detector test. Okay. So there's our second guy. Then it says, if he is not guilty, and then I see the word then because we have that if in the front. So what is he is not guilty? Uh-huh. Then takes the lie detector test. So what we want to see is which one of these are equivalent. Which one of these have the same matching truth values, if any? I have an answer. If you do not see the word not, then it's a normal state statement. You see the word not, that means it's a negation of it. All right. So. We'll get there. So we need to take these sentences by sentences. So again, there's only two statements. So it's true, true. False, false, and then this is true, false, true, false. Okay, so let's take our first sentence. What do we need to do first? Let's take A. What do we got to do first? We got to negate what? No. Negate the Q. So it goes false, true, false, true, and then now we can do the conditional. Who is the antecedent? P. Who is the consequent? All right, only false when P is true and then 
negation of Q is false. So my first guy is true false, so that is false. That's our false case. True, true is true. False, false is true. False, true is true. So this is what A is. Now let's figure out what statement B looks like. So we need what this time? All right, we've got to negate P first then. So negation of P leads you to false, false, true, true. And then now we can do the or. So this is statement B. So or is only false when both are false. So it goes true, false, false, false. True, true, and false, true. All right. So do A and B match? No, they're not the same. We got fa false and true, true and false. It's not the same. So A and B are obviously not equivalent. So maybe now we got to look at C. Well, not maybe now. But we do. We've got to look at C. All right. So we have all the information to actually do C right now. We already have negate P, and we have the Q. So negate P, arrow, Q. All right. So who is the antecedent this time? So antecedent. Who is the consequent? Okay. So remember, only false when it goes true to false. So it goes false to true. What is that? True. All right. Then it goes false to false. Then it goes true to true. And then finally it goes true. Or sorry. True to false. That's a false. All right. So does C match with anybody? By A or B? No. So is anybody equivalent? That's why they said the if any. So there are none are equivalent. I don't know why that just disappeared. So weird. Okay. Had any of these had matching values in the end, then we would have said, hey, those two are equivalent. Say it again. They're not equivalent. These two match, but these two do not. Oh, A and B? A and B don't match. False to true. Nope. And if you try to look at A to C, false to true? Nope, doesn't match. No one's equivalent. Well, no, you can look at, you got to look at all of them as a whole. This column does not match that column. This guy goes false and then three trues. This guy is not false, followed by three truths. A and C? No, they're not inverses of each other. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Down to the end. So this time now we're working with arguments. And again, with arguments, you can either look at the chart that I gave you to tell if it's valid or invalid, or you could actually run a truth table on it. This is like the last problem where there is a truth table. So, again, the first thing you're going to have to do is convert these into their symbols. So I see an if. That means that there's a then. So it says we close the door. What is that? P. P. 
then is a what? Arrow. And then there is less noise, which is Q. All right. Board's going crazy on me. All right, the next one says there is less noise. So what was that? Nope. That's Q. See, look. This guy is Q. That guy is Q. Because they're both about less noise, right? Put my little line. I have my therefore symbol. And then it says, we close the door. Who was that? That was P. Because it matches the P that we talked about up above. So there's what our statement looks like in symbols. So you can take this and look at your chart and see if that's on there to know if it's valid or invalid. Or we can turn this into the truth table. So I want to go through the truth table real quick and then we'll look at the chart. So despite the sentence making actual sense to words analyze it from an English standpoint, it's invalid because it's Yes. Yeah, so if you, so there we go. So if we actually looked at the chart, this one is on there. This is called the fallacy of the converse. Yeah. Fallacy of the converse. Let me fix my C right there. So we know that this is because it's a fallacy invalid. But let's run the truth table just to double check that. Because remember, to be valid in a truth table, you have to be all true. You have to be a tautology. So in here, we need to take this statement right here and write it as one statement that we can run a truth table on. And how we do that is we put a bracket, and then you put a parenthesis, and you put the first statement in there. So my first statement, my first premise was P arrow Q. Then you put an and symbol, put another parenthesis, and you put the second premise, which was just Q. Close your bracket. So remember that your premises, they go in parentheses, and there's an and between each and every one of those. The therefore symbol up here becomes the conditional, and then you write your last conclusion statement. So this is the statement we want to check in a truth table. So from here, we start running our truth table on this. Good thing is we only have two statements. So it's true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. All right, so what are we going to look at first? <clears throat> yeah, start right here inside your first parenthesis that's inside your bracket. Do P arrow Q. So who is the antecedent? P. That means Q is your consequent. So it goes from true to true. That's true. It goes from true to false. That's your false one. False to true and false to false. Okay. So what are we going to do next? The and symbol. Yeah, finish out your brackets now. So we, we already know what this guy is, my parenthesis. Now we're going to do the and with the Q. And that will complete the bracket part. So ands are only true when both are true. So we got true, true. We got false, false. We got true, true. Stop it. And we got true, false. Okay. And now what are we going to do? The arrow. Now we take care of the whole shebang. All right. Who is your antecedent? The everything that's not P. 
Everything that's not P. The entire bracket column. Who is your consequent? P. P. So, in this one, it goes from true to true. Then it goes from false to true. Then it goes from true to false. And that's right there is what makes this now invalid. And then if you do the last one, false to false. You can do either one. I'm showing you both methods. Because this guy, obviously, you can see on the chart. And then right here, if you don't know the chart, then here's a way to verify it. And because of this guy that's right here, this is why it is invalid. Because in order to be valid, you have to be a tautology. It has to all be true. That's what a tautology is. And last but not least, numero 25. There are two parts to number 25, but I will tell you when you take your test for me, there will only be one. Okay? So, work with me through this. So what you're going to do is you're going to make Euler diagrams. Euler diagrams. You're going to learn about those in class. Just follow with me. So we're going to take each one of these sentences and we're going to turn them into basically Venn diagrams. So this is what they're going to kind of look like. So this first sentence, it says, all clocks keep time accurately. This is what we call the A. This is what we call the B. And because it is all... Your circles will look like this. You'll have one circle inside the other. A, which is about clocks, I put in the center. B, which is about accurate time, I put on the outside. Because all my clocks are accurate. So, from here, what we're going to do is we're going to take the second sentence, and we're going to infuse it into the first picture. So the second sentence says, all time measuring devices keep accurate time. So time measuring devices is my new A. Accurate devices is my B. So looking at my, sim looking at my circles here, my B that's up here, which is accurate time, that's my giant circle that's right here. I just need to make sure that the time measuring devices are in that circle. So this circle could look like this. Because my time measuring devices is in the accurate time. But when you do Euler diagrams, you have to consider every situation. There are other ways this can look. It could look like this. Where my two circles don't touch each other. And still, they both represent the statements that are up there. Clocks is inside accurate time. And time measuring devices is inside accurate time. But still, there's another circle that could look like. So you have to consider all possibilities when making Euler diagrams. It could look like that. And still, clocks is in my accurate time. Time measuring devices is in my accurate time. And last but not least, your circle could look like this. Maybe they just overlap each other a little bit. So these are all the different pictures that this can look like up here. The last thing that you're going to do is you're going to make sure that this happens in every picture. You want to see that clocks are time measuring devices. And you need to see that in every picture. So in other words, what, you, what you're looking for here is you need every picture to show you a circle of clocks inside the time 
measuring device circle. So does this first one show you clocks inside the time measuring device? No. This is a false diagram. Because here it shows that the time measuring, measuring devices are inside the clocks. Does this one show that? No. Because my two circles aren't even surrounding each other. Does this one show that? No. These just show my two circles have an overlap. This one right here, this is the one that shows that clocks are time measuring devices. But the problem is, is that not all my pictures are true. That makes this invalid. In order to be a valid argument for Euler diagrams, it must be true in all pictures. And we have three pictures up here that are false. So then we got one more. All right, so taking this sentence by sentence. First, it says all physicists are scientists. So that means we have a circle of physicists, and then there's a circle of scientists that surround it. Because all physicists are scientists. Now, the next sentence says all scientists attend college. So that means my giant circle of scientists is surrounded by another circle of those that attend college. Now the cool part about this is there's no other way to draw this diagram. This is the only diagram for this guy. So when we look at our last sentence, it says all physicists attend college. So do you see the physicist circle inside the college circle. Yes, this is true. Come on here. So that means that this is a valid argument because there's only one picture and it is true for that picture. It had three pictures that were false. Now, don't worry about the wording. I need you to have the Euler diagram. That's what these are all about. You've got to have the pictures. Uh huh. The, the pictures. Uh, we will be looking for the pictures, and if there's no pictures. If, if you just do a 50-50 guess on it, you'll miss some points. Yeah. yeah, good point. No, you need to do Euler diagrams. Yeah. It's a Euler diagram. That's what we want to see. And they're only going to be one of those. Okay? Any other questions? I think we're going to figure that out class. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, thanks for coming out. Wrapping it up. You do not get extra credit for this. Uh, we, we all took time out of our 50 lives.